Um, throughout the lecture, feel free to um, ask questions. Claire has some pauses in there um, when you're especially uh, welcome, and she'll sort of, you know, manage the floor there. And then uh, about you know halfway or three quarters of the way through, um, there'll be a break when you can come up, ask for more questions, anything you haven't had the chance to talk with her about, um, or get, get more snacks, and um, then we'll complete the, the lecture. Um, so Science in the News is an organization. We do a lot of things. We do this uh, spring lecture series. Um, we also have one in the fall, which is a very useful definition for us because most of us probably broke a law sometime this week. Simply my jail. I know I did it on my way here. So. <laughs> we're not going to use that definition of criminal behavior. What we're talking about tonight is going to be really just extreme violent criminal behavior. So we're not talking about people who committed tax evasion. We're really focusing on violence and aggression. But this, you'll see, is a problem that's going to come up again and again in the research studies that we talked about tonight, is how do you define what you're trying to study. So for the purposes of tonight, we're going to break aggression down into two types of aggression that are frequently distinguished between. So the first type is called instrumental aggression. And this is characterized by a lack of emotional sensitivity. So this is typically associated with a disorder called psychopathy that some of you may have heard of. If you haven't, we're going to talk about it in a minute. But these tend to be goal-oriented crimes, um, not crimes of passion, but planned out. Um, often the targets are people that they didn't know, things like this. Whereas the other type of aggression is an inability to control your emotions. And this is called reactive aggression. So typically this happens after somebody's been in a fight, and then they just can't temper their response. Um, and so this is the second type of aggression that we will be talking about. So psychopathy, which is the disorder frequently associated with um, instrumental aggression, is a disorder that is often characterized by the lack of empathy or 
force. Um, other characteristics of people with psychopathy include compulsive lying, manipulativeness, and egocentrism. Um, but it's not only a uh, disorder of criminals, but we do frequently think of it in association with criminal behavior, in large part because while only about 1% of the general population is considered to be a psychopath, about 25% of the prison population uh, is considered to be psychopathic. And additionally, they're responsible for an estimated 50% of our crimes. Um, however, there's also an overrepresentation of psychopaths as CEOs of Fortune 500. <laughs> <laughs> It's estimated that about 3% of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are actually psychopaths, although it's hard to talk to them into taking the test. <laughs> so, uh, but the reason that we often think about psychopathy and criminal behavior is not only that these psychopaths are responsible for a disproportionate number of crimes, but also because psychopaths are much more likely to commit another crime. So when a psychopath is released from prison, there's about an 80% chance that they'll commit a second violent crime within three years. And when a non-psychopathic uh, violent offender is released, it's about 50%. And so typically, diagnosis as a psychopath is used to argue for longer prison sentences or to argue against parole, because it's thought that these people are the most likely to commit another crime. Um, so how do we diagnose a psychopath? There's a test um, that focuses on about 20 psychopathic traits. And the person is scaled on a score from 0 to 2. 0 being that trait is not present, and 2 being that trait is highly present. Um, so most people in this room would score less than a 3 out of 40. And generally, the cutoff for a psychopath is a 30, um, just to give you an idea. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, so I'm going to introduce the two cases that we'll be talking about later in the evening now. So the first case we're going to be discussing is the case of Brian Deegan, and he typifies this instrumental aggression. Um, he was diagnosed as a psychopath, and he's a convicted rapist and serial killer who murdered three uh, So he's a prime example of instrumental aggression. And the other case we're going to talk about is the case of Bradley Walter. And he attempted to murder his ex-wife. He murdered his ex-wife's friend. And all of this uh, was done in an extremely violent fashion and after having and so this would be a prime example of reactive aggression. And so I'm going to come back to these two cases once we've talked about the biology, because both of these cases actually had biological evidence admitted in the trials as evidence of a mitigating factor and reasons that their sentences should be removed. So we're going to talk about what that evidence was. So this is sort of the roadmap for the evening. We're going to start by talking about regions of the brain that may or may not be involved in violent behavior. Then we're going to talk about the role of neurotransmitters. And if you don't know what a neurotransmitter is, do not panic. We will talk about that in detail. And then finally, um, after the break, we're going to come back and talk about potential genetic contribution to violent behavior. So first, we're going to talk about potential regions of the brain that may be involved in violent behavior. And so this is a concept that the concept that different regions of your brain do different things dates back to a theory called phrenology. And phrenology was really popular in the late 1700s and most of the 1800s. And the idea was that because different parts of your personality lived in different parts of your head, you could actually read someone's personality simply by reading the bumps on their skull. Um, this is not true. <laughs> but it did lay the base work for a concept that many people do believe, which is that different regions of your brain have different and the first real evidence that we got that this might be true came from this man, a man named Phineas Gage, that some of you may have heard of. And Phineas Gage was a railroad worker in the mid-1800s. And his job, um, they were trying to blow a hole in a mountain to put a tunnel in. And his job was to take this long iron you see him holding there and to tamp down on explosive powder in a hole before they exploded it. And typically, you would put a layer of sand between the explosive powder and this metal rod so that you prevented any sort of a, a spark and then any follow-up explosion. But for whatever reason, um, one day in 1848, Phineas Gage forgot to put the sand there. And so he damped down, there was a spark, and there was an explosion. And this rod that he's holding um, shot through the air and landed 80 feet away from him. But unfortunately for Phineas, it went through his head on the way, 
<laughs> so it actually entered below his left eye and then exited out the top of his skull. But what's really remarkable about this case is that not only did Phineas Gage survive, he regained consciousness within a few minutes of the event. Um, he was talking, he knew who he was, he had all his memories, he could make new memories, he had his cognitive functions. He seemed to be doing most of the things you need your brain to do. And this was despite having lost what his doctor described as about half a teacup full of brain. So, but he was still pretty much able to function. The only difference that people really noticed in Phineas Gage is that he seemed to not be himself anymore. So he was a little bit more impulsive, he lacked social decorum that he had had before, he swore a little more often, he wasn't really the type of guy you wanted to bring around your friends anymore. But that was the only change people noticed. And so this was the first kind of solid evidence that a specific part of your brain might be very important in regulating your behavior. And from studying people, uh, like Phineas Gage, who have lesions in different areas of the brain, scientists have been able to kind of tease apart which parts of the brain are important for which functions. Um, if you guys are interested in Phineas Gage, you can actually go see his skull, as well as the rod that went through it, uh, right here at Harvard Medical School. It's in the Warren Anatomical Museum, which is open to the public. So. Um, so this is your brain, and it's divided into four different lobes, the frontal lobe, which is over here, the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, and and so the concept of functional specialization is the idea that different areas of the brain are specialized for different functions. And so what we think, the frontal lobe is very important for decision making, for choosing between good and bad outcomes, things like that. This is the part of the brain that was damaged in Phineas Gage. The parietal lobe does a lot with sensory information. The temporal lobe is primarily where your language is based. And the occipital lobe is your primary visual so it's thought that each of these lobes has distinct tensions. And so this led to a hypothesis in the field of biohavior that possibly, if different locations in the brain have different functions, then maybe differential activity in these different regions could be one of the reasons that some people are violent and others are not. So I'm going to stop here and take some questions if anyone has any on the concept of functional specialization or the types of aggression. And then we'll talk about the studies that have been done. Yes, go ahead. I actually have a question about psychopaths. I mean, if they're compulsive liars or whatever, why would they ever sit down and honestly answer? So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the question was, if psychopaths are compulsive liars, why would they ever sit down and honestly answer questions? So that, that's exactly, the answer is that's exactly why you have to have a trained psychologist do the assessment. And it's not entirely them answering questions. It's also their, uh, their life history. And so, they can be scored for like acting out as children, things like that. So there are other components that go into it. Um, but yes, that's a. Okay, great. All right. Did you say that yeah, about three percent of the population are psychopaths? So, so it's estimated that one percent of the general population is a psychopath, but three percent, of course, is probably the other. But that's a very rough estimate. You have also the kind of presentation of the, let's say, violent kind of occupation. Uh, the boxers. Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that actually. That's a good question. I don't know the percentage of psychopaths and other. Um, it typically tends to be so. Um, it's it tends to be there's a there's a list that where people would like rank the top professions, and a lot of them are things um, like CEOs, lawyers. Uh, I can't really remember what else is on there. It's not a lot of violent, uh, violent careers, but it, um, um, so that actually there's a distinction. Surgeons, yes. Primary care doctors. So it's not well understood. We're going to get to that part in the genetics uh, section. There does seem to be quite a bit of heritable, um, <coughs> heritability for psychopathy, but that's for the trait in general, not necessarily for the violent component of it. So it's not well understood what makes some psychopaths become violent and other psychopaths become CEOs. That we don't know. <laughs> 
How did he get the thing through his head? He was trying so to get something else. Phineas like, Gage, that was an explosion yeah. that shot through his head. Oh. He, didn't, he didn't become a psychopath, he just had altered me. Oh. Yeah. I was just wondering uh, um, if you could explain. It was uh, just on the immediately prior screen of that hypothesis. I didn't quite. Yes. Okay. So the hypothesis <coughs> that we're, that's actually where we're going after this week. So I will explain it and then we'll move on. So the hypothesis is that you have different parts of your brain that are responsible for different things. And some of those parts are more important in regulating your behavior. So by looking at which parts of the brain are more or less active in violent offenders, you may be able to see a difference between violent offenders and nonviolent offenders because of where that activity is located. So that's the hypothesis. So how do we address this? So there are two types of functional imaging that have been used frequently to address this type of a question. And one type of functional imaging is called PET scanning. You guys may have heard of this. It's often used um, in the clinic to measure uh, tumor growth, things like that. The other type is pretty much only used in the research world, and it's called fMRI. So PET scanning measures levels of glucose, and fMRI measures essentially blood flow and levels of oxygen in your brain. But I'm going to describe them both in detail. So we're going to start with PET scanning. So PET scanning is based on the concept that your brain needs energy in order to be active, and typically this energy is delivered in the form of glucose, which is a sugar. And so the areas in your brain that are taking up the most sugar are the ones that needed the most energy, and so those are probably the areas that are the most active. And so the way you can measure how much glucose is being taken up in different regions of the brain is by actually injecting somebody with radioactive glucose, um, and then looking to see where it goes, because you can read out the radioactive signal. So you would see different areas of the brain light up. And what it ends up looking like is something like this. So the areas in yellow are the areas that took up the most radioactive glucose, so they're thought to be the most active. And the areas in blue and green are the areas that are thought to be the least active, because they took up the least of this radioactive glucose. So one of the studies that was done using this type of scanning uh, took 22 murderers who were pleading not guilty by reason of insanity, and they compared them to 22 non-murderer controls. Um, so that could be like anyone in this room, is essentially what they're comparing it to. I'm assuming. Um, <laughs> and the question that uh, they asked was, is there a difference in the activity of the murderer brains compared to the non-murderer brains? And I just want to point out, they did not distinguish between the two types of aggression that we talked about. They simply selected them based on the fact that they were murderers. And so what they found is actually that, yes, there was a difference. And so when they looked at a control brain, they saw activity uh, all throughout the brain. And just to orient you guys, this is a top-down look. And so the face of this person would be pointing that way, and we're looking from the top down. Um, and so this is the frontal cortex, the area that's thought to be really important in decision-making skills and in regulating your impulsivity. And what they saw was that in these murderers who were pleading not guilty by reason of insanity, there was a decreased uptake of the glucose in that region of the brain, suggesting that potentially this area was less active. And they did these scans, just these people were doing just a simple cognitive test. So they had them just sort of uh, doing a repetitive task. I think it was if the number one shows up, push a button, if the number two shows up, go. So you had to pay attention, but it was a very simple task. And then they scanned their brains, and this is what they found. Do you have a well, you, I think you answered that. I was going to say, is this a stable pattern? Across yeah. all activities, or is this a special? So we don't know. Yeah. So this was done in the specific context of this cognitive task. Um, so whether or not this is always true, or whether or not this is true when you're making a decision to murder someone, we don't know. Yes. Okay. So murderers that uh, were pleading insanity and uh, control people that didn't do any murdering. What about exactly. murderers that did not plead insanity? So yeah. So they did not do that in this study. Um, some studies have looked at that. Uh, some of them see the same differences, some don't. So that, but you pointed out a good caveat to these studies. Um, so obviously, murderers being not guilty by reason of insanity are probably very, very different from just a normal control. And we can't really tell if this the potential psychiatric uh, disease that they have, or is this the fact that they chose to become violent? You know, you can't you can't tell that from this particular study. Um, 
Okay, so the other type of functional imaging is called MRI, and, uh, or functional MRI, sorry. And this relies on the idea that areas of the brain that are active, um, they need more glucose, they need more oxygen, they need all this delivered to them, and so they'll get more blood flow. And so you can read out the areas of the brain that have the most oxygenated blood, and it's assumed that those areas are the areas that are the most active. And so where PET scanning is done on the order of 30 minutes that they were measuring this activity, this is within four to six seconds after sleep. So it's a very quick response and then it goes away. Um, and so one study that was done using this type of imaging uh, took criminal psychopaths. So they were had the psychopathic trait um, and they were also criminals. And they compared them to six non-criminal non-psychopaths. And what they did is they showed them a series of pictures. So they showed them some positive images, like the puppy. This happens to be my family's puppy. <laughs> um, they showed them a neutral image, like a fork. <laughs> and then they showed them a negative image, like a stalk. And they looked to see what the activity in the brains of the psychopaths versus the criminal psychopaths versus the non-criminal non-psychopaths was. And they did find some differences. So this, these are composite images. And the areas highlighted in blue are areas where they saw higher activity in the psychopaths regular, uh, relative to the normal controls. And the areas in red, which is really just these areas, are the areas that were higher in the normal controls relative to the psychopaths. And the green areas, they saw activity in. Um, so they did see some differences. Uh, a number of studies have been done similar to these types of studies. And they all kind of get various results. They're all using different stimuli. Um, they're using different populations of psychopaths, non-psychopathic criminals, things like that. Um, so they're hard to compare, they're not perfect, but some things have seemed to come up again and again and again as being regions that are different in these brains. And so the first region is the frontal lobe, which we talked about, which regulates decision-making skills. But the other region that people have observed differences in is this region called the limbic system, which is in red here, and this is a slice through the middle of the brain. Um, so it's kind of in the center at the bottom. And this area is thought to be very important for emotional control. And so these are the two regions where different activity is frequently been observed. However, the changes that people see are different. So sometimes they see it go up in criminals, sometimes they see it go down. It's not consistent. But these are the two regions that come up again. But there are a number of limitations to these types of studies. So this is actually a salmon that was given fMRI. So they put it in the fMRI machine, and they asked it some questions. <laughs> and they got some meaningful brain activity. <laughs> so that's a little surprising that the salmon can think in response to your questions. But what makes it even more alarming is that the salmon was actually dead when it did. <laughs> so it turns out that there's a lot of complicated statistics that have to be done to figure out which areas of the brain are actually active and which ones aren't when you're doing functional MRI. And if you don't do those statistics correctly, you can get brain activity in a dead <laughs> <laughs> So that's one caveat to these studies that have been done. But there are other limitations, some of which we've hit on, some of which we haven't. So these were very small studies, right? So first we were looking at 22 people, and we were looking at six people. All of the studies that have been done have had very small study sizes. So it's very difficult to assume what that means for the world at large from six people versus six people. Another issue is the control groups that have been selected. So we've been choosing controls as just normal, non criminals, nothing going on there, and comparing them to very extreme groups, right? And so potentially a better control group, for instance, um, in the criminal psychopaths versus non criminal psychopaths would have been. Uh, or sorry, non-criminal non-psychopaths, would have been actually non-criminal psychopaths if you actually want to assess the violence, right? But they didn't do that. Another issue we have is how they're selecting their aggressive groups, right? So we pointed out murderers are not guilty by reason of insanity. Um, you can't really compare the results of that study to a study that looked at criminal psychopaths. We don't really know if those groups are very similar at all. And so it's been very difficult for people to uh, look at all of this data as a whole and tease any data. Um, and the last thing is you're comparing very extremely different groups, right? They're selecting the absolute extremes, murderers pleading not guilty by reason of 
versus people who have never committed any violent crime. And so there's a lot of different variables there. Typically, the people they're selecting have been incarcerated for a long period of time with other grievance plans. Um, they're pleading not guilty by reason of insanity, so they could have other psychiatric uh, issues. And then they've also committed this crime. And so it's difficult to know what these studies really mean, but this is what has been uh, done so far. Um, so just to summarize, <laughs> we talked about the concept of functional specialization, that different areas in the brain have different functions. We talked about two different types of functional imaging studies that, can, that have been or imaging techniques that have been used to do studies on this. And then we talked about the limitations to this data and how much we still don't really know about what this so I'm going to stop here and take questions on that, and then we'll talk about the first case study. Gotcha. Uh, there is a hypothesis that someone brought up that cannot be addressed with the patient. Is it anyway possible that life experience could change that behavior in yes. that case? Would that be that there must be that they are already diverted and stuff? Yeah. All those things could, could have changes. And so the, the question was, could life experiences be affecting these scans? Absolutely. We, these are just readouts, right, of whatever, you know, your brain, after you look at a picture of a puppy, who knows what's causing that difference, right? We don't even know on, on a cellular level why that difference is happening. Um, it's assumed to be difference, differential activity in the brain. We don't know. Absolutely, life experiences could be impacted. So often, these are taken years after the person committed a violent crime. Again, they've been incarcerated. All of that could be impacted. So, this, this is definitely not necessarily due to genetics in any way. Um, these are just observational studies that have been done. What is the difference? You had a slide where it was changes in the um, limbic system versus the prefrontal cortex. I'm wondering what those different. Psychologically, the difference of the activity levels. And I know prefrontal cortex has to be impulse control. Yeah. Behavior, but what was the limbic system? So the limbic system does a lot with emotional regulation. So often it's observed to be less active in the psychopaths. It, on the theory that, and the theory is that they have uh, sort of less emotional sensitivity, which is why they don't feel empathy towards other people, things like that. It's not always the case. Actually, in the study I showed you, the limbic system was more active. This is a reactive crime, so obviously very active. Right, and well, that would be the theory. Um, the brain scans haven't always been improved. Yes? Uh, I'm curious if the prefrontal cortex is linked to uh, executive function, also kind of long term planning. Isn't it possible that lower prefrontal activity could just mean that people are? Maybe less successful in society and less powerful. Yeah. They, they find themselves in more vulnerable situations. And maybe it's not connected to violent behavior, but just being in a situation where you'd be more vulnerable to be in one of those situations. Yeah. So the question was is it possible that having less activity in your prefrontal cortex could just mean that you're more vulnerable to being in these situations? And that's absolutely the future. Yeah. Okay, so piggybacking on that, is there some other study? Uh, you know, you know, groups of study data on other populations of people, people that are uh, basically having marginal success in life for whatever reason, you know, you know, that are you know, having other kinds of difficulties in society besides crime that you can compare the, you know, these results with. So the question was, are there other studies that have been, that have been done on other sort of marginalized populations that are having difficulty in society that we can compare these with? I don't know of any. A lot of the studies that have been done are um, looking at differences in groups of people with various psychiatric illnesses. And they see lots of differences there. They're not always consistent with the differences that they saw here. Um, I, I honestly have never looked for that, so they're very well made. Okay, I'll take one more and then we'll find it. Okay, and, and so in uh, trying to explain these differences, has anyone explored the idea that, that perhaps um, the brain um, what, the brain differences weren't driving the behavior, but the behavior was driving the brain differences. Yeah. So yeah. that. So the question was: Is has anyone explored whether or not perhaps perhaps the brain brain differences were not driving the behavior? The behavior was driving the brain. 
that is entirely possible, and I don't know of a study that's been done in a way where they could actually tell. Um, is it hard to construct a study like that? I, I think it would be fairly difficult because it's not, well, we don't know how, it's also not clear how um, changeable and malleable these brain differences are. So I don't know of any studies that have really, you know, looked at the same people after again and again and again, you know? So I don't know whether this this is, you know, you can intervene in a way and change that or, you know, I think it would be a difficult study to do, but it is an important caveat to the studies that have been which is that we have no idea why this brain activity might be different or if it's even positive. So, okay, we're going to move on and talk about our first case study now um, because it uses this type of technology. So just a quick reminder, Brian Dugan is our example of instrumental aggression. Um, and in 2009, he was uh, being sentenced for killing a 10-year-old girl that he confessed to killing 26 years after the murder took place. Um, and at the time, he was actually already serving two life sentences for his other murders. He scored a 38 out of 40 on a psychopathy checklist, so this is tremendously high. His status as a psychopath was not questioned by either side. Um, and because he was pleading guilty, he had confessed, um, they only had a, a sentencing trial. And so the decision was whether to give him another life sentence or to give him a death penalty. And so uh, the defense actually argued that because his fMRI, which was done, showed differences um, that had been seen in other psychopaths, that this, was, that this demonstrated that there was a biological basis to his problem, and therefore he should only receive the life in prison rather than the death penalty, because this was not his fault, it was his biology. Um, so the judge actually decided that the jury could not see the actual scans of the brain. They were allowed to have the scientists who performed them come in and describe the differences in the scans, but they did not see the actual scans. Um, and this is one of the, I believe, the only time that psychopathy was actually used to argue for a lesser sentence. So typically, remember, because it's associated with recidivism, it's typically used to argue for the, the greater sentence. Um, so, and this is the first and only time that that MRI has been used in a trial. What does a normal person score that he scored at 38? So a normal person would, uh, typically the cutoff is like 5. It's a, it's a continuum. You know, there are people that fall in the middle that we wouldn't diagnose as psychopaths. But general, the general population would score less than 5. And anyone who scores 30 or above is considered to be a psychopath. What's the percentage scoring? So I, I don't know the exact I, I, I don't know the answer. Um, okay, so I'm just curious. How many of you think that the jury was swayed by the use of fMRI and that they decided to give him a license? And how many of you think that the jury was not swayed and that they gave him a license? So it's about 50 50. So they were not swayed, they gave him the gun. But it turns out that Illinois actually outlawed the death penalty in 2011, so we switched back to it. <laughs> um, but this was the, the first and the only time so far that fMRI has actually been used in a trial. But um, because this technology is becoming more and more available, one group wanted to know, how is this actually going to impact the way that judges view psychopathy if they have a biological explanation for it? And so they did a study to look at and so they sent out a questionnaire to a bunch of judges um, using a blinded trial that was actually based on the real, the real life case of um, Stephen Mulvey. And so in their case, they presented these judges with a um, hypothetical situation where a man went into a fast food restaurant and attempted to rob the restaurant. And when the manager would not give him the money, uh, he aggressively and very violently assaulted uh, the manager. And afterwards, um, the offender showed no remorse whatsoever and, in fact, bragged about the crime to the extent of getting a tattoo commemorating this crime. And so, very specific <laughs> behavior. Um, and so, they first asked uh, these judges to tell them what is the average amount of time in prison you would give someone for aggravated that 
and it's convicted by a jury. And they said, okay, on average, we would give someone charged with aggravated battery about nine years. And so then they gave half the judges the story I just told you and with the information that's been diagnosed with a type of that. And they said, okay, sentence this specific. And so those judges said, okay, 14 years in prison for this man. Because he's a psychopath, he's likely to recidivate, he showed no remorse. So they gave him a higher sentence than he would average. Um, average the state of this one. But the other half of the people received the same story I just told you, the same information that they've been diagnosed as a psychopath. But in addition to that, they received a biological explanation for what psychopath is. And these judges gave him 13 years. So they saw the biological explanation as a mitigating factor, and they uh, actually noticeably reduced the sentence of this uh, hypothetical prisoner based on this biological explanation. Still more than you would get a mere non but it's the first evidence of, this is sort of one of the first trial uh, studies that's been done on how this uh, type of evidence might actually impact the world. Um, okay, so so far we've been talking about the brain from really, really far away, just general regions of the brain that are active or inactive. But now we're going to talk on a much, much more specific level, um, on the level of the neuron, which is the basic cell of the brain. Because there are billions of neurons that make up the brain. And this is where all of that activity is uh, hypothetically created. So neurons are the basic unit of the brain, and these, these are cells that are actually polarized. So their two ends are different from one another. So one end is responsible for receiving signals from other neurons, while the other end is responsible for sending the signals to other neurons. And so the signaling end of one neuron will meet up with the receiving end of another neuron, and this is how information is passed. However, there's a gap between these two neurons, and they need to spread this signal across the gap. And the way that this is done is by using these small chemicals called neurotransmitters. So when the first neuron receives a stimulus, this causes it to release its neurotransmitters into the gap between the two neurons. And when the neurotransmitters are in the gap, some of them will meet with and bind to receptors that are expressed on the receiving end of the other <coughs> neuron. And when this happens, this tells the other neuron to turn on. And so this is the way that neurons can signal between one another. So these neurotransmitters are small chemicals, and you've probably heard of a lot of them. So serotonin, dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, these are all examples of neurotransmitters that have an important role in your brain. But you need to be able to turn this signal back off, right? So you don't want to just release the neurotransmitters and have the signal on forever. And so the way that that is done is that they're actually reuptake transporters so that sit back on the first neuron, the signaling neuron, and they will kind of scoop up the neurotransmitters in the gap and bring it back into the first neuron. And this is the way that they turn off this signal. And we have a lot of evidence that the levels of neurotransmitters in your brain can affect, can affect your behavior. And one of the biggest pieces of evidence is that SSRIs, which are a type of drug that block this reuptake transport, are a very um, a useful and effective therapy for treating depression in many people. So this is used a lot. So um, Prozac is an example of an SSRI. So you guys probably heard of these. And another uh, piece of evidence we have that the levels of neurotransmitters in your brain can affect your behavior actually comes from uh, people with Parkinson's disease. So people with Parkinson's disease often receive level uh, uh, drugs that will boost the levels of dopamine body, and this can attenuate the symptoms that they have from having Parkinson's disease. But after long-term dopamine replacement therapy, where they're getting these higher levels of dopamine in their body for a long, long time, some people develop a syndrome called dopamine dysregulation syndrome. And this syndrome um, is associated with a lack of inhibition and very compulsive behavior. So one side effect is that some of these people become very compulsive gamblers, um, people who had never gambled before. And so this is another piece of evidence we have that the levels of these neurotransmitters can be very important in regulating. And so this, why can't they take all the dopamine for the Parkinson's that it helps? It helps well, with the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. But how so they stop having involuntary neurotransmitters? Yeah, it, it's, it uh, reduces the levels of involuntary Because that's also regulated by neurons, and so they found that dopamine. Oh. Um, 
Okay, so this led to that hypothesis that altered levels of serotonin could be leading to aggressive behavior. Um, unfortunately, you can't actually study the levels of serotonin in the brain where it's active. And so most studies that have tried to look at this have used cerebral spinal fluid, which is the fluid that's in your spine, but it's also the fluid that kind of soaks around your brain and keeps your brain from hitting the sides of your skull. Um, and so the thought was that if you looked in that fluid for kind of the breakdown on byproducts of serotonin, that might be a readout of the levels of serotonin. But we don't really know if that's true. And um, these studies have had difficulty coming up with a real conclusion because there's no consensus as to what is normal for levels of serotonin in the cerebral spinal fluid. So right now, this uh, hypothesis can't really be addressed because we don't have a consistent way of testing for levels of serotonin. But we're going to come back to the concept of neurotransmitters and neurotransmitter levels in the genetic section of this talk. Um, so we're going to stop for the break here, but I can take some questions first before we do so. Yeah. Okay, so no consistent way of measuring serotonin levels, but is anybody playing with any uh, kind of techniques for trying to measure the levels of serotonin? So, and what sort of technology? Yeah, you I mean, people have been looking, basically, they've been measuring the byproducts that occur after you degrade serotonin in different fluids in the body. This is like the main way of looking at that. Right. Um, but it's, so no imaging or anything like that? I don't know of any imaging that has been done to look at, at least not in the Yeah? Is there any medicine that's used for treating serotonin levels? Yeah. 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 No, so psychopathy is considered, oh sorry, the question was is there any medicine used to treat psychopathy? Psychopathy is considered incurable right now um, and untreatable. And unlike other psychiatric illnesses, they actually think that psychologists and psychiatrists doing the therapy makes it worse because of the manipulativeness and that this is like another target to manipulate. Um, so there's no known beneficial intervention yet. There is a strong link though between being bipolar and psychopathy, right? So they they come out from that angle? Um, so, I mean, they would treat the, in that case, they would treat the bipolar, but there's the psychopathic side of it would be untrue. Okay. We can take a quick break, and then we'll get into the genetics. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
instruction 
result and a change in the order of these letters will result in a change in the way the protein is um, And so every individual, because they have two copies of every chromosome, has two copies of every gene. Um, but there are the many variant forms of each gene in the population as a whole. And these are what we call alleles. So for example, there are three alleles for blood types, A, B, and O. And so, for example, my mother has an A allele and an O allele, and my father has a B allele and an O allele. And I receive two O alleles, one for my mother and one for my father, but my sister receives an A allele for my mother and the O allele for my father. And so while there can be a large variety of different um, alleles in the population, each individual, because they only have two copies of that gene, will only carry two alleles at most. In my case, I have two of the same. Um, okay, but most of the genetics is not as simple as inheriting blood type. So, unfortunately for us, behavior typically is a combination of both your genetics and your environment, which is anything that's happened to you. So, this is sort of the nature versus nurture. So, something that's purely nature or purely genetic uh, would be your blood type. So, that was in my blood type, this is my blood type because that's what my genes are. It has nothing to do with where I was raised or how my parents raised me or what food I ate as a kid. That's just my blood type. Whereas something that's entirely environmental or entirely nurtured would be the language that you speak. There's nothing in my DNA that says I have to be speaking English right now. That's just because I was raised. But for the vast majority of our traits, there's some interaction between these traits. So an example would be height. So people who are raised during times of starvation are typically shorter than their parents and shorter than their offspring because they have this environmental component that's interacting with their genetics and producing their plan. So most behavioral traits are a result of this interaction. They receive some input from your genetics and then a lot of input from your environment, and that's what produces your um, So when we talk about behavioral genetics, we use a word called heritability, and this is how we measure how much genetics influences the observed variants across the population. So we can divide the um, sources of this, these traits into three areas. One would be genetic, and that's your heritability. Uh, one would be shared environment. So the shared environment is any environment that would be shared with your siblings. So it would be the town you grew up in, your parents, things like that. And then non-shared environment is anything that was absolutely unique to you. So any life experiences that only you. Um, but what's different about heritability from inheritance, which we've been talking about, is that inheritance, like I inherited my blood type from my parents, can be discussed on the level of the individual. Whereas heritability can only be assessed and discussed on the level of the population. So heritability describes um, the percentage of variation that we see in this population of a specific trait that can be attributed to genetic variation within but it doesn't tell us anything about what's happening on the individual level. So height is generally thought to be about 80 to 90 percent heritable. But we don't know that 80 to 90 percent of the reason I'm as tall as I am is because of my genes. So how do we know that some behavioral may be heritable? So typically, we do this using uh, twin studies. So the way twin studies work is that we can compare <coughs> identical twins and fraternal twins. And this is really useful because identical twins came from the same egg, so they share 100% of their genetic material. Whereas fraternal twins came from two different fertilized eggs, so they're only about as related genetically as any other sibling, which is about 50% of their genetic material. And what we can do is ask if one twin has the trait, how likely is it that their other twin also has that trait? And if, if it's something that's highly heritable, we would expect that identical twins would share the same trait more often than fraternal twins, because identical twins share more of the same genetic material. Another study we can do to try and tease apart the difference between genetics and environment is an adoption study. And so in an adoption study, we would look at the trait of the biological parents who contributed genetic material to the offspring. And then we would look at the traits of the adopted parents who contributed environmental um, aspects to the offspring. And we would see how often does the offspring share the same trait biological parents versus their adopted parents. And so this can give us a sense of how much of this is due to genetics. 
Um, so a lot, a lot, a lot of studies like this have been done on aggressive behavior in general, not distinguishing between the two types. And each one finds something slightly different, but an analysis was done of 51 different studies that were done on twins or adoption. And they found that about 40% of the observed variants in aggressive behavior across the population can be attributed to genetic variation. So this suggests that there is some component, uh, some genetic component that's contributing to aggressive behavior, but that a lot of it is really in lactose. <coughs> um, similar studies have been done with the psychopathic trait that I mentioned earlier. So um, about 60% of the psychopathic trait is thought to be uh, due to genetic factors, and about 40% is due to unique environment, and they actually found no contribution from the shared environment in this study. But remember, not all psychopaths become violent. So this is just the psychopathic trait in general, not violent psychopaths. Um, so I'll stop here and see if anyone has any questions on human genetics, behavioral genetics, or heritability. Um, shared environment is something like shared as in like if all Americans, for example, share it and then non shared is specific, or what is sort of the magnitude yeah, of so, shared? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a little vague, but typically they would, they would be anything that you would share with your siblings. Uh -huh. um, so, like in the twin studies, both sets of twins have a shared environment, so you're controlling for shared environment, and the only environmental factor you're seeing there would be non shared. I'm sorry, can you go back just for a second to the bijan? Like you were saying that the psychopathic trait is heritable as in versus inheritable or confused. So heritable and versus inheritance is just a different way of talking about how the genetics are affecting a person. So inheritance, we talk about on an individual level, like I inherited my blood type. Heritability is on the population level. And so it's saying in a population of people, the genetic difference between those people is contributing how much to the observed difference in how aggressive they are. But this doesn't, doesn't say anything about an individual. So it says in the population, about 60% of the difference we see in how psychopathic people are is due to their genetics. But it doesn't say an individual person whether it's entirely genetic. So what was the difference between this and the previous one? These are just different measuring oh, So okay. this is aggression in general, and okay. this is psychopathic. Oh. Okay, so how do we figure out what is causing this heritability? How do we identify which genes are the reason that we can see this heritability? So there are two different approaches we can take. One is called the genome-wide association study, and this is considered an unbiased approach because it looks at all of the DNA and then looks for associations. Um, and I will describe that in more detail in just a minute, but essentially your genome is all of the genetic material of a single person, and you can look across all of that and see if there's an association. And the other approach would be a candidate gene approach. So this is a biased approach, because you essentially make a hypothesis, pick your favorite gene, and then look to see if there's a difference in that gene in the population. Um, so how do we identify these traits? So we divide the groups of people up into two different groups. One is people with the trait, and one is people without the trait. And then we look to see how often different alleles show up in each of these groups. So in this case, the yellow allele we would not consider to be associated with the trait because it shows up with equal frequency in the people who have the trait and the people who do not have the trait. However, this red allele we would consider to be associated with the trait because we see it much more often in the people who have the trait versus the people who do not have the trait. However, it's important to point out that this is not 100%. So there are a number of individuals who have the trait who do not have this red allele. And then there are also individuals who do have the red allele but who do not have the trait. So it's simply saying that it's associated. Um, so when you do a genome-wide association study, you look at sites all throughout the genome. So in this, and you get a graph that looks something like this. And so each color is an individual chromosome, and each dot is just a different set along the chromosome. And when the dots cross this red line, that means they are significantly associated with the trait. So in this case, they found five areas in the genome that were significantly associated with their trait 
So a genome-wide association study was done this past year looking at antisocial behavior, and they found nothing. So, <laughs> a little disappointing, but we see that there are no dots that are crossing this red line, right? So they found no genes that were significantly associated. Um, so why not? Well, one reason is that genes and environment interact, right? And they didn't really take that into account when designing their study. They were just looking purely at genetics and not dividing people up based on the environment that they had lived in. Another is effect size. And so this is essentially the concept that there may be so, so many genes involved in this, and each one is only contributing about half a percentage point of that hair rate. And so it's many, many genes with a tiny, tiny effect. And so it's very hard to pick that effect up against all of the noise, right? Another reason is that it could be very genetically complex. And so what this means is that maybe it's not just, you know, you have one gene you don't, but maybe if you have that gene in the context of having many other specific alleles, then that has an important role. But if you have that allele and not these other alleles, it doesn't matter. Right? So there could be an interaction between all the different alleles, making it very complex and making it very difficult to pick up any specific allele on an unbiased approach. And another is how they define antisocial behavior. So in this study, they simply had people fill out a survey asking them questions like, did you get in trouble a lot in school? Did you get convicted of a crime? Things like that. And that's how they define their group of antisocial uh, behavior. But potentially, there are many, many, many different causes to all of this antisocial behavior. And so maybe if they looked at a more specific group of offenders, um, they might have found something. So what about candidate gene approaches? Unbiased approach to So there have been many candidate gene approaches that we're going to go through. But one of the first ones focused on the Y. So it's well known that males commit about nine times as many murders as females. And the most obvious genetic difference between males and females is that males have a lot of chromosomes. So this was a really clear cut, easy to think about hypothesis, right? Y chromosomes are common. And in 1965, <laughs> a, study was report, a study reported that when they looked at inmates in a, an institution, they found that more of them than usual actually had an extra Y chromosome. And so, they call this the super males, or XYY syndrome. And in this case, so typically you have two copies of every chromosome, right? But every once in a while, people end up with a third copy of a chromosome. So Down syndrome is when you have an extra copy of chromosome, three copies of that. So in this case, these people were ending up with an extra Y chromosome. And so they had two Y chromosomes. Um, but so this was a nice theory that this extra Y chromosome but when bigger studies were done in the general population, it turns out there's absolutely no correlation whatsoever between having an extra Y chromosome and the rest of the behavior. Um, really, the only, so most males who have an extra Y chromosome have no idea that they do, because the only side effect is you're slightly taller. Um, some people think acne is associated with it. It's really not, um, most males don't know. So this was a bust, but there was another candidate gene hint that came in the 1990s from a large Dutch family that reported many of the males in their family having extremely aggressive behavior along with borderline mental degradation. So these males had committed a number of arsons, had attempted rape, things like that, and there were many of them concentrated in this one family. So that was very interesting. So this is a pedigree of that family where the circles are all females, and the squares are males, and any squares that are red were males that were affected by this syndrome. And since it was only males that were affected, it was thought that potentially this gene was located on the X chromosome, because females have two copies of the X chromosome, so these females with the red dots could carry the allele that was causing this syndrome, but not actually have it themselves because they have another X chromosome with a different allele. Whereas the males only have one copy of the X chromosome, so that's their only allele of that. Um, so they narrowed this syndrome down to a region of interest on the X chromosome that contains a gene called MALA, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But what they found was actually that there was a T instead of a C in all of the males that were affected, as well as in one copy of the carrier. And it turns out that by simply by changing the C to a T, it means that this protein doesn't get made. And so these males were having no MALA made. And this was thought to be the reason 
that they were exhibiting such extremity. And this is called Brenner syndrome after the man who found the mutation. Um, so what is MAOA and why did this happen? So MAOA is a encodes for a protein called monoamine oxidase A, which is essentially a little pathway enzyme that sits in the signaling end of a neuron and heats up all the neurotransmitters when they get brought back in and degrades. So it has an important role in regulating the levels of your neurotransmitters, particularly serotonin, which is something people have been interested in for a long time. And so these males had no MAOA, and so this would lead to a dysregulation in their levels of serotonin. And so that was the hypothesis for why they're exhibiting such aggressive behavior. However, it's important to point out that we actually don't know if it was this particular function of MAOA that was causing their aggressive behavior. So they also have this borderline mental retardation, and in mouse models, if you delete MAOA, you actually see severe developmental changes in the brain, and so it's possible that this aggressive behavior actually do to brain developmental differences rather than the actual specific function. We're not sure. But this was a hint that MAOA could be involved. It was exciting. People got excited and were like, okay, who doesn't have MAOA? And it turns out that it's only those males in that one. So nobody has found <laughs> anyone else that has the So we found out why 14 people are drunk. But uh, that's not it. But it did lead to a hypothesis using the biology, right? So we see that maybe there's this dysregulation. And it turns out that there are actually two different common alleles of MAOA in the general population. And they have a different regulatory region, which means that one of these alleles gets turned on at a higher level than the other one. And so people with MAOH are thought to have higher levels of MAOA in their body than people with the MAOAL, which stands for low, which would have lower levels now this has never actually been demonstrated in the brain, so we don't actually know if this is functionally true in the brain or if it alters neurotransmitter levels in the brain. But this was the hypothesis. <coughs> so people started looking at this MAOAL version, and they thought, well, again, in males, this would be their only copy of the allele. And so if they have this lower activity version, maybe that's dysregulating the way their neurotransmitters are working, and maybe that underlies some aggressivity. And so this is the hypothesis. And one of the first studies to show any sort of link between the AOAL and anything else um, found that there's actually no difference between MAOAL and high MAOA um, when you just look in the general population. So in the lack of an environmental control, there's no difference between the percentage of people who commit violent crimes. In fact, it's a little higher in the high MAOA. Um, however, they looked at people who reported being maltreated as children. And there they found there was a slight increase in the number of people who went on to commit violent crimes who had the low version of MAOA and had been mistreated as children. Now, of course, the vast majority in both of these cases went on to not commit any violent crimes. Um, but there was a slight increase in it. So does MAOAL really predispose to violence? <laughs> A number of studies have tried to replicate this finding, and they've met with varied success. So some do see the same interaction between childhood maltreatment and MAOAL. Some see no interaction, and some actually have seen the opposite. So some studies have found that high MAOA in childhood maltreatment produces a higher level of MAOA. So it's a little unclear. But the one thing that all of these studies have shown is that there's absolutely no difference between the levels of aggression or crime in people with the MAOA allele and just the general population. So in the absence of an environmental insult, everyone pretty much agrees that MAOA allele means absolutely. And additionally, about 35% of males actually have this allele, and obviously 35% of males haven't gone around committing violent crimes. So it's likely to be a very small population of the MAOA allele possessing males, if any, that are predisposed to this. Um, and lastly, I want to point out, these are poor, all correlative studies, not positive studies. So every study we've talked about tonight has simply produced a correlation, and we don't know if it's actually positive. And the difference between this is pretty important, because there's actually a correlation between levels of ice cream consumption and levels of violent crime in major cities. And so 
we could come up with a hypothesis that eating ice cream makes people want to go commit crimes, or else that after you've committed a violent crime, you really want to eat some ice cream. But <laughs> <laughs> that's probably not the most likely explanation here. So what people actually think the reason is, is that when temperatures go up, violent crime goes up. And when temperatures go up, more people want to eat ice cream. And so while these two are correlated, there's probably not a causal relationship between ice cream consumption and violent crime. But we really can't say for any of the things we've talked about tonight whether it's actually a causal relationship. So I'm going to stop here and take questions, and then we'll talk about a few other genes that have been involved. Do you have any questions? That should be on where they were meant they had very low levels. They had absolutely none. Oh, so no they were they had no functional MALA. So they so none of their so they had an excess of serotonin. Yeah. So the right? yeah. So the MALA is responsible for degrading the neurotransmitters. So the theory is that you may end up with too much serotonin. Um. So MAO. Well, that would be the theory. Right? But we don't really know what taking away MAOA does to neurotransmitters, so it's really just a dysregulation. That's really all we can say is that it's probably dysregulated um, because you're lacking this protein that's responsible for the brain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they have a and if you'd like to continue discussing this, maybe you can do that after. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, do people ever do studies looking in like multiple effects at once and see if there's like like gene interaction effects? Yeah, more complicated. Yeah, effects. so the problem is, right, we have so few candidates to look at right. that it's hard to know which ones you should be looking at. Um, I don't know of any studies that I've looked at uh, having like multiple different alleles at once, which is not having them yet. Um, if, you look at, if you look at the general population having different alleles or different genes, is that are they generally kind of like independent from each other? Um, so they can track with ancestry, um, but other than that, I mean, there's independent assortment of alleles because, like, of the basic Mendelian concept. So it shouldn't matter, you know, what you got on one chromosome or the other chromosome. They take that. So, um, yes. There have been studies that look at uh, genetic link to, say, anxiety and in general, um, and so they looked at that as well, um, and they saw a slight correlation, but again, only in the environment of maltreatment as a child, um, and again, that's been difficult to look at. But yeah, many of them are actually looking more broadly, just kind of in Western behavior. Um, you don't actually yeah, I'll take them more than you have. What about aggression studies in other species? Uh, like mice? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably knows more than I do on this, but uh, yes, there have been a number of studies on mice. Actually, we did a genome-wide dissertation study in mice for aggression. Um, it's always difficult to really define, you know, what does a mouse's aggressive behavior mean for a human's aggressive behavior and things like that. Um, so they've looked at these genes. Uh, mostly, so mostly they've done actual whole mapouts of the gene. So similar to what like the Dutch family would have, rather than trying to get the low activity alleles, but um, they see some correlation with the Dutch. It's been hard to wrap up here. Okay, so we'll move on and talk about a few other candidate genes. Um, so another candidate gene that people got interested in because of this link with potential link with MALA is this uh, gene called COMT, and so the protein that COMT goes for. Is another Pac-Man like guy that also is involved in degrading neurotransmitters. This has a slightly different specificity, so it primarily degrades dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. But because it has a similar function to MAOA in the brain, people thought, well, maybe COMT is involved. Um, so some studies have shown, specifically in schizophrenic patients, that there might be an association between a lower activity allele of COMT and violence. But this is not a solid correlation, and no one's really shown anything in non schizophrenic patients uh, with CLMT. So we don't really know about that. 
Um, another theory that was out there is this uh, serotonin transporter. So this is the transporter that sits on the signaling end of the neuron and scoops the neurotransmitters back up when it's time to end the signal. And so there are also two different alleles of this, and one leads to higher expression of this transporter, so we have more of these transporters, and one leads to lower expression. And so people thought, well, maybe the one with lower expression, you have too much serotonin in there, maybe that's associated with that. Um, there's really no, uh, so a lot of studies have been done on this, none of them have really shown strong effects. So some see an effect, most don't. Um, and they haven't found an environmental link the way that people seem to. So we're getting a lot of mixed messages on all of these candidates, right? So what do we do about that? Well, there was a study of all of these studies um, <laughs> that was done actually just last month. It came out in April. And they, what they did is they took all of the studies that have looked at candidate genes and aggression, and they pooled it all together and tried to say, OK, if we take into account all of these studies, do we see an association between any of these genes and aggression? So they looked at 185 different studies that have been done on violence and aggression, which involved 31 different Gene. So this included MAOA, COMT, and uh, the serotonin transporter, the three we talked about. But it also included a bunch of other ones that I didn't bring up today. Um, and this was from over 60,000 different individuals between these 180. So they looked at all of this, and they looked and said, OK, are any of these genes significantly associated with our And they found them. So no, that's just but yeah, there's, they have, none of these candidate genes seem to be associated with violence and aggression, at least in the absence of a specific environmental. Um, and I want to remind you guys that genome-wide association study didn't find any of these candidate genes either. So they're in here. They tested it. None of them came up as soon. So if these genes are actually associated with aggression and violence, it's probably only in very very specific environmental situations. And what that really tells us is that genetics is not necessary. So having none of these genes means you're going to become a violent or aggressive individual. And it's really all the environment in connection with these genes that may or may not be producing this increase in aggression. But what that also tells us is that it's clear, clear that we could take intervention to prevent any individual with a violent gene um, from becoming because it's really not about the gene, it's about the environment that that gene is in. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to our second case study, the case of Bradley Walter. And so Bradley Walter uh, was charged with first-degree murder and attempted first-degree murder after he murdered his ex-wife's friend and attacked his ex-wife. And this was after a very uh, involved argument, if you'll recall. So he's an example of reactive aggression. And so these charges that he was charged with carried the death in the state of Tennessee. And so during his sentencing, or sorry, not his sentencing, his, the guilt phase of his trial, so when the jury was trying to decide what to charge him with, his defense uh, admitted evidence that Bradley Walter carried the MAOAL allele, or the low MAOA allele, and also that he had been maltreated as a child. And so the defense argued that because he had this allele, and because he had been maltreated as a child, he should be convicted on a lesser sentence that does not carry the death because he had this gene. Um, okay, so how many of you think that the jury decided to convict on lighter charges? So not the death. What state was it? Tennessee. Oh, so. right. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait. <laughs> so who thinks they went with lesser charges? All right, who thinks he got the death penalty anyway? All right. He actually was convicted on lesser charges. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the jury actually returned a verdict of voluntary manslaughter and attempted second degree murder, as well as there's an aggravated kidnapping charge. Yeah. Was there a history of violence prior to that? Um, he, so I don't believe so, no. I mean, he, he clearly was a not a great. Guy because he had <laughs> 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 this violent crime, but also so that ex-wife actually um, the reason that she survived it is that she and her friend who went over to his house had 
told another friend that if they weren't back by a certain time, they should call the police. So there's something there that made her a little bit afraid. But I don't know of a specific history lesson. Um, but anyway, he was sentenced to 32 years in prison because he was convicted on monster charges. And this is the maximum of the charges he was convicted on. Um, and so afterwards, they interviewed the jury and said, you know, how much did this you know, play a role in your decision? And many of the members of the jury said that actually it had been very persuasive. Um, and that bad gene was a bad gene. And that was why they decided to teach him lesser traits. Um, all right, so to summarize what we talked about tonight, we talked about functional imaging studies and how there may or may not be some differences in the activity in different patients of the brain. We talked about the neurotransmitter hypothesis that potentially there may be a dysregulation of neurotransmitters in the brain to viral offenders. And we talked about genome wide association studies looking for genetic links for this violent behavior that has come up with nothing. And then we talked about candidate gene approaches, which has similarly pretty much come up with nothing. <laughs> um, so I hope another thing that you guys will take away from tonight is that the scientific uh, process is a long we start with many hypotheses, and they don't always pan out. So this was an early Leonardo da Vinci drawing of a flying machine uh, that probably didn't really work. So we ended up with flying planes, you know. But this is really a biology still in its infancy, and the study of aggressive and violent behavior is really a lot closer to these early sketches than it is to any sort of plane that can actually fly. Um, so I want to thank our sponsors, and I will take any general questions. So the question was, when the studies where they're measuring aggression, how are they defining it? So it's different for every study, uh, to be honest. A lot of them, it's, uh, some of it's self-reported aggression, so that you literally get like a survey and you check off if you ever you know, kicked your family's dog, if you ever been convicted of a crime, things like that. Some of it is um, other reported aggression, so they'll send a survey to your parents or your teachers or things like that. Because typically these are done in cohorts of, of people where they have a lot of information about them because they've studied them for a lot of different things. So like the MAOA aggression uh, study was done in a large cohort of Australian twins that have been used for many years. Um, so, so everything is a little different. Um, yeah. And that's one of the, the that's difficulties. That's a, that's a real problem. Yeah. Yes. yeah, I'm not sure how to word this, but I'm going to go to the mm -hmm. And he says that 70% of incarcerated folks get crimes that are caused by drug and alcohol. You know, drug and alcohol abuse mm -hmm. contribute to mm -hmm. and the incarcerated folks. Incarcerations didn't get a share of the crimes. But it's one thing. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, what is what could the impact of drug and alcohol abuse be on this type of thing? So yes, obviously that could have a huge impact on that. Um, and there, so there is some question as to whether you know it's more of an addictive behavior, right? That might actually end up being read out as an aggressive behavior. If you're more likely to be addicted to things like that. Um, so it's a it's a confounding factor uh, for sure, and it's definitely uh, when the people are interested. In it. All right, let's uh, wrap up there. And, um, those of you who have still have questions, come down. Um, everyone else, uh, pick up some flyers on the way up. Get scheduled for our upcoming events, and let us know what you thought on the um, surveys. And um, thanks to you for coming and excited to lecture. Yeah, I guess. Yeah.